Hello and welcome everyone to our Find Your Ancestor sh session for today. Um, so today we're going to be talking about school records. I'm Katie Stope. I'm the local history librarian here at Appleton Public Library in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, for those who are outside of Appleton or outside of Wisconsin and don't know where Appleton is, um, we're just south of Green Bay. Um, so that's where Appleton is. Thank you again for joining us this evening for our webinar. A huge thank you to the Friends of the Public Library for providing funding for our Find Your Ancestors series and allowing us to continue bringing amazing speakers like tonight. Um, we have speakers actually every month. If this is your first Find Your Ancestors series, um, we have happen to have one every month, once a month. Um, usually during the, the year we have um, Saturdays at 2 p.m. is our time period, um, but this summer we're trying something a little different where we're doing Thursdays at 6 p.m. Um, so definitely um, feel free to mark on your calendars and check out the handout um, for when our upcoming sessions are. So our August session is going to be on getting the most out of Fold 3 Library Edition, and we're going to have that August 14th, August 18th, August 18th. Um, and that's going to be with Deborah Dudick um, from Illinois. She's a fabulous speaker. If you haven't attended one of our sessions before, we've hosted her last year and she was phenomenal. So definitely check out the handout. I've posted the link in the chat and are posted a couple times throughout our session today if you haven't had a chance to grab it yet. Um, but that will be our next session. And then um, starting with our September 10th session, we will go back to that Saturday at 2 p.m. time period. And that session is going to be on the Czech archives. Um, later this year, we'll also have sessions on identifying and interpreting historic photos in October, um, researching Native American ancestors in November, and then we're going to do a big DNA workshop in December where we're actually going to have two back-to-back -back DNA sessions. So definitely check out the link to the, in the handout um, to register for those programs. Just a reminder, even if you register tonight, um, you still will get a reminder email a week before, a day before, and an hour before. Um, and that's kind of your reminder um, that you signed up for that. But definitely be sure to put that on your calendar as well. If you've missed any of our past Find Your Ancestors session, um, you can definitely check out our library's YouTube channel. There's a link, of course, in the handout. And of course, not every presentation is recorded or up there indefinitely, um, so be sure to attend live if you're able to. We are recording today's session, and a link to the video will be sent out to everyone, hopefully by tomorrow or Saturday at the latest. If you have any questions during today's session, we have a Q&A box that's located on the bottom of your screen, and we'll answer questions at the end. I also have uh, closed captioning enabled if you need it. You're able to push that button at the bottom of your screen. Just be aware that they're not 100% accurate since it's a live transcript. If you have any library specific questions or need help navigating any of our genealogy databases, you can feel free to reach out to me. My email address is in the handout as well on that first page. I also offer one-on-one -on -one, um, hour-long sessions on Zoom to help people with genealogy or navigating those genealogy databases. So feel free, even if you aren't a member of the Appleton Public Library, to reach out to me and schedule a time to learn some more. Finally, at the end of today's presentation, there's going to be a short, short survey from Project Outcome, which is an American Library Association sponsored initiative. If you could take a minute, it's just a short eight question survey. It really helps to give us feedback on what you thought of today's presentation. And there's also a spot on there to let us know what topics you'd like us to cover in the future. I'm just getting ready to start our 2023 sessions. Um, so, you know, letting me know what you're looking forward to seeing in 2023 will help me as I'm trying to find speakers. Speakers. Without further ado, I can introduce our speaker today. Today we have Melissa Barker. She is a certified archives manager and public historian currently working at the Houston County, Tennessee Archives. She is affectionately known as the Archive Lady to the genealogy community. She lectures, teaches, and writes about the genealogy research process, researching in archives and records preservation. She conducts virtual presentations across the United States and other countries for various genealogy groups and societies. She also writes a popular blog entitled A Genealogist in the Archives and is a well-known published book reviewer. She has been a professional genealogist for the past 17 years with expertise in Tennessee records, and she's been researching her own family uh, history for the past 32 years, so she's quite an expert. Everybody, welcome Melissa. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Um, 
I hope that you are all ready to learn about school records. Um, uh, this is something I actually came a little bit late to as far as using these records for my genealogy research. Um, I used to think to myself, well, why would I want to know my ancestors' grades? That's not something that would be of interest to me. But when I worked, started working as an archivist, um, we have, thankfully, um, a lot of school records. And it really got me thinking about the wonderful information that can be found in these records. And so we're going to talk about these. And I hope, I hope that you find that you want now want to look into your ancestors' school records. So school records, uh, they are fantastic school records to find. Uh, this is actually a photograph of some vintage school supplies that we have in our archives at the Houston County Tennis uh, Archives and Museum. Uh, we, have, we have a vintage school desk that we have these on. Um, the school records are not just grades. They incorporate all kinds of information. And if you're like me, uh, when I research my ancestors, I want to know everything about them. I want to know what they have for breakfast. I want to know what their hobbies are. I want to know the full story of each one of my ancestors. If I'm just looking at their birth, marriage, and death date, that just doesn't tell me much about them. Uh, and so I'm always looking for new kinds of records or other kinds of records that I can search in to find information about my ancestors. Um, here are a couple of some examples. You're going to see a lot of photos and, and scans of documents in my presentations because I like to show people that the records really do exist. Uh, this is a donation that we received in the archives and museum from Miss Lola Knight's family. Miss Lola Knight and her sister, Laura Knight, were twins, and they were educators in our community for decades. Uh, and so as you see there on the left, there are two school registers. Those are original school registers that the teachers used to put the students' names, their grades, um, their attendance, uh, and any other information about the student in those school registers. And then the two scrapbooks that you see, the one at the bottom is a scrapbook for the Retired Teachers Association, the local chapter that she was a huge part of. And she kept newspaper clippings, original photographs, all kinds of wonderful information. And so if you have a teacher that's an ancestor, look for scrapbooks like these. The scrapbook at the top is kind of interesting. You'll notice that these scrapbooks are in those magnetic sticky albums that were produced back in the 60s and 70s. Um, I like to say that these albums are the kind of albums that archivists love to hate. <laughs> we do not like these kinds of albums because they really can damage your photographs and documents. But the one at the top there dates from about the 60s or 70s, but all of the photographs that are in this scrapbook date to the 1920s and 1930s. But unfortunately, she did not put a lot of names with these photographs. So this is just um, an example of what can be donated to an archive from a personal family collection. So what types of schools would you encounter or would you be looking for to look for records? Well, first you're going to be looking for those elementary and secondary public schools. Any public school uh, may have surviving records. Now, one of the challenges is finding out where those records are. But elementary and secondary public schools, universities and colleges, and even if your ancestor didn't go to school, which you're going, I'm going to do a whole presentation on that, uh, check those university and colleges. If your ancestors did go to college, check those colleges and universities for records. Um, I did find that my husband's great, great, great uncle <laughs> actually went to Vanderbilt University and became a doctor back in the 1800s. I was able to contact them. Unfortunately, they did not have a lot of records that survived, but they did have an alumni pamphlet that listed him as an alumni of the school. So that was something I was able to get a copy of. Military academies. Maybe your ancestors went to a military academy. So don't forget about those military academies that are out there. Uh, maybe the military academy no longer exists and their records are transferred to another university or another archive. Um, half the battle as genealogists is just finding wherever the records are located. And then don't forget professional schools and special education schools, any type of school. Uh, my mother, her senior year of high school, she got the opportunity to attend a professional dental assistant school. So she did not attend her high school as a senior, but she went to this professional school. Uh, and so that's something different that I was able to research and get records for. 
and private schools. Some of our ancestors may have gone to private schools. Uh, these records are just a tad difficult more to find. A lot of times they don't survive, but they may have been given to an archive of some kind. Um, they may have been given to a state archive some, in the United States. We have 50 U.S. states and all 50 U.S. states have a state archives. So always check in those archives for these kinds of records. Here's another school record that I wanted to show you. This is from 1890, September the 20th, 1890. This is from the Houston County, Tennessee Archives and Museum. This is the Houston County Educational Institute. This was just a private institute that we had in addition to our regular public schools that were in our county. And so these uh, records exist and we are able to have them for our patrons. So what kinds of records do you think you can find in school records other than, ju than just the grades? Um, availability of school records are going to vary from state to state, from county to county, from school district to school district. Uh, and so, like I said, half of our battle is just trying to find those records. Uh, don't give up too easily because many times um, you may think that you don't know where they're at or maybe someone tells you they were thrown away when in actuality they are sitting in someone's attic, someone's barn, maybe in an abandoned uh, government owned building. And like in my case, uh, there was a building that was behind our middle school that belonged to the local school board. And it came time for them to want to get rid of that building. Well, there was records in that building. That building had been there since the 1960s. And they asked me, because I'm the county archivist, to come look at the records. Well, there were about 50 filing cabinets filled with school registers that dated back to the 1920s. And this incorporated all of those little one room schoolhouses that would be in each and every little community. So we had them all transferred to the archive, which was fantastic. But I didn't know about them until they were ready to do something with that building. Uh, and so there are records that are being donated to archives every single day. So regardless if, it's our, regardless if it's school records or any other kind of record, we should constantly be checking with those repositories where our ancestors lived to see what kind of records they have received recently, because you may find something for your ancestor that wasn't there before. Uh, this is another school um, record example. This is from the New Hope School. This is the souvenir holiday greeting card from 1917. It was donated to our archive. And when you look inside of it, it has a list of all the students. Uh, and so it's, wouldn't this be wonderful for you to find for your ancestor, for the school that they attended? Um, one of the things that I do as a genealogist is when I can find the school that one of my ancestors went to, I kind of go all out. I research the school itself. I try to find a photo of the school. Um, I try to find out what kind of um, events that took place at the school um, and find them in the newspaper when they graduated and things like that. So there's lots of things that can be found for schools. So these are the kind of records I'm going to talk about in this presentation. We're going to talk about school census or scholastic statistics. Uh, this is something that you may know as a genealogist because we are always looking for census records, aren't we? Did you know that they also took school census? And so this may be something you want to look for. We're going to look at enrollment records where your ancestors may have enrolled at a particular school. This is actually going to help you to place your ancestors in a time and place. If you have some ancestors like I do, some of my ancestors moved around a lot. And so you may be able to look to the school enrollment records for their children to figure out where they were, when they became into a place because they had to enroll their children in school. We're going to look at attendance records. Attendance records can actually tell you a lot about your ancestors. Um, so we're going to look at that and I'm going to show you some very interesting things about attendance records. We're going to look at report cards. Um, how all of us have our own report cards. I've got some of mine that I saved. I've got some of my grandfather's report cards that I have from the 1930s and 40s. Uh, and so we're going to look at these and uh, look at what we can glean from these records for genealogy purposes. We're gonna look at yearbooks. Now, yearbooks is probably one of the most known and popular type of school record that genealogists look for. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about those yearbooks. So we're also gonna talk about school newspapers. I don't know about you, but when I was in school, especially high school and junior high school, we had a school newspaper. Um, I was not privileged to be on the school uh, staff, the newspaper staff, but we had a school newspaper and I've actually saved mine from when I was in school. 
you may find school newspapers in the archive and it may show something about your ancestors. And local newspapers. The local newspapers always printed uh, stories about the local schools. Maybe they even list your ancestor being um, having perfect attendance, or maybe they listed them as being a graduate of the year that they graduated high school. So local newspapers are also a fantastic resource. School photographs. I don't know about you, but I'm constantly looking for photographs of some of my ancestors that I don't have photographs for. So you may be able to find them in the school records. Uh, maybe there is a group school group classroom photo and your ancestors in there and you might be able to get that picture you've been looking for. Sunday school records. Did you know Sunday school records would be a type of school record? Uh, we actually have some of these records in my archive. And so this is why I added this to this presentation. Sunday school records can actually help you with your ancestors uh, in many different ways. So we're going to talk about those. So first and foremost, we're going to talk about school census or scholastic population census. Uh, these records uh, sometimes are called scholastic population census, and they're not that prevalent. Not all states or areas took these censuses, but these records were normally recorded at the local level. The information that they gathered were gathered at the local level, and if they survive, they are a great resource for genealogical information. So what kind of information can be found in these records? The name of the student, obviously. Well, if you're having trouble with finding a middle name of your ancestor, maybe it would be on the census. Uh, and so the name of the student is fantastic to find if you find your ancestor. The age of the student. What if you do not have official records to determine the age of your ancestor? This might help you. List of schools, uh, list of schools in the area. Maybe if you're trying to figure out what schools your ancestor went to. And so this might be able to help you to figure out uh, where the area that they lived in, what school they might have attended. List of teachers. If your ancestor is a teacher, a great place to find information about that ancestor that's a teacher. And so that might have those. So here's an example of some uh, data in a scholastic uh, census. Uh, this is actually from 1929 to 1930, and I'm going to blow this up for you here in just a second, but I want you to look at all the wonderful information. Uh, the student's name is over on the far left. We have first grade, uh, second grade, third grade, fifth grade, uh, and so it's fantastic information, and I'm going to blow it up here just a little bit so you can see the information. So this is not just grades. <laughs> In fact, there are no grades on this record. So we have under first grade, we have uh, Dorothy Baggett. So under her, you can see that she, her age is six. Uh, she's in the first grade. It gives her address is Route 2 in Erin. And as you come along there, you look over there and it says distance from school uh, and it says one mile. So that tells you how far she was from the school. And then it gives the name of her parent or guardian. Leonard Baggett. So this is a great place to find parents' names or guardian names. If your ancestor didn't or their parents were no longer living, it would list their guardian. Then it lists the occupation of that parent or guardian as farmer. So a tremendous amount of information. Now, when you come down and you look at Hope Knight, uh, she's about the one, two, three, four, fifth one down. Uh, it actually gives the year and the month and the day of her birth. How wonderful is that, especially if you can't find a birth certificate. Uh, you can use this as some proof of her, uh, her birth date. Uh, and of course, it gives um, where she lives, five miles from the school. Uh, her um, parent or guardian is George Knight, and he's a brakeman. Now, we had the railroad that came through here, so he's probably a brakeman on the railroad. So these census records are phenomenal. Uh, and so you need to look in the areas where you're doing your research, see if they have these records available, and look at what kind of information you can find. Next is enrollment records. Uh, and what can be found on enrollment records? Now remember, these are records when your ancestor would come into an area or starting school, they would enroll them in school. We do that today with our own children. Uh, and so in enrollment records, some of the information you might be able to find are, of course, the student's name, parents' names. Um, we are always looking for a parent sometimes. If we haven't been able to determine a parent for a, a child that we have in our ancestry, 
there's going to be parents' names. And if it's, the parents are no longer living, you're going to see guardians, the ones who are now the guardian of that child, either a grandmother or maybe it's a guardian that was appointed by the courts. Also in enrollment records, you're normally going to see an address or an indication of where they lived. I know I'm constantly trying to figure out where my ancestors lived. And I don't mean just in this particular state. I mean, what community, maybe even a street address. Uh, and so this always helps me when I find them in the enrollment records. And you might even find a date of birth or an age of the student. Again, this is gonna be further proof of their date of birth or their age that you're looking for. And so these enrollment records have some fantastic information. Uh, you may also find possibly the name and location of the previous school, especially if the student has transferred into the school mid-year. Uh, if they haven't started uh, at the beginning of the year, if they came in a little bit later, they may list in the enrollment records what school they were coming from, which will give you information on where that family moved from. So see, these school records have a tremendous amount of information. So here is an enrollment record. This one is from the 191920 era. This is from Miss Lola Knight. That's the scrapbooks I showed you earlier. I found it interesting that even on this enrollment record at the top there, it says taught by Lola Knight, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Ben Knight. So even on this record, it gives her parents. Uh, and so that's fascinating. You've got the boys on the left, the girls on the right. It gives their names and then it gives their ages. Uh, and so what a fantastic uh, document to have. This is the campground school. It was a one teacher, one room schoolhouse. And see all those children here. And you can tell that a lot of these are siblings because they have the same last names or they were cousins. And so maybe you can also find other members of the family listed in the enrollment record. This is another interesting uh, enrollment record. Ms. Lola Knight actually taught in several schools. So this is the Cave Orchard School from 1922 to 1923. There are some interesting things on this particular enrollment record that you should pay attention to. Again, they have the boys on the left, the girls on the right, and it gives their ages. But this time they've separated them by grade. So you have first grade, second grade, third grade, and fourth grade. But I want you to look under first grade and I want you to see Willie and Ewing and Musser, who are brothers. And they're aged 14, but they're in the first grade. Then look under second grade over there to the right, and you see Lydia Mae Bryant, and she is 16 in the second grade. When I first saw this, I was kind of confused as to why a 14-year-old would be in first grade and a 16-year-old would be in second grade. But I did some research. I talked to those in the education field. And I was told that at this particular time, that when a student would come into the school, um, they would be tested. And wherever they landed, no matter what, wherever they landed in their education level, that was the grade they were put in. So if they weren't uh, up to speed on writing or reading, arithmetic, something like that, they would put in a lower grade than what their age is. So what does this tell me? This tells me that I need to be aware of that and I need to look at all records as much as possible. So next are attendance records. Why do we need to look at attendance records? Why does it matter if our, if our ancestor was in school one day as opposed to another day? Uh, these are almost always kept uh, by the schools because attendance, especially today, but back in the day, the attendance of the schools was reported to usually the state level. And those state uh, uh school uh, superintendents and the state school organizations, that's how they determine how much money they would send to that district for the operations of their school. So attendance was extremely important to the school system. So these records were used by the schools to obtain state or federal funding uh, to operate their schools. Now they didn't get a whole lot back in the days, back in the 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, and so as, as it's come forward, they've gotten more and more. But back then, the communities were really responsible for taking care of their schools and even financially. Uh, and so it's important that we look for these records. So what can attendance records tell us about our ancestors that would help us with our genealogy research? Well, they will place your ancestor in a time and place. If you see that your ancestor was in school on certain days at certain times, you know they were living in that area, they were attending school, and especially if you didn't know where they went or when they moved to a particular area. So they can help you with that. 
Um, a lot of times you're going to find that attendance by some of the children, uh, sometimes it's mainly boys, was mainly in the winter months. And why is that? Is that's because a lot of the times the boys and some girls had to stay home to help with the farming uh, in the summer months. So there's the attendance is usually pretty good in the winter months, but if you look at the summer months, you're going to see that some children weren't just not able to go to school. They had to stay home and help the family farm. If you see that there is an absence, uh, and the attendance records, especially if there's more than a couple of days of an absence. It's possible that there was something happening within the family or with that particular student that you might be able to correlate with other events in your genealogy research. So if there's a death in the family um, or the fact that they moved, all of a sudden they're no longer in the attendance record, so maybe they moved. And so attendance records can actually guide us and help us in our genealogy research. There's one school register that I have that lists that on a particular day that the whole entire class was actually um, allowed to go home for the entire day because of a death of a student. Now, this is from 1911. And unfortunately, there are no death certificates at that time for this person. And I was able to document that death by the fact that it was mentioned in the school records. And so you school records are just phenomenal. So report cards. I don't know if you have any of your old report cards and you may not want to show them to any of your family members. And maybe your ancestors don't want you to see theirs either. But these could be important and, sh and give you some great information for your ancestors. I think they're a great genealogy resource. Uh, most of the times, these kinds of records are going to be found in personal family papers. Uh, they do get donated to the archives. I have several of them that have been donated within family papers at an archive. But a lot of times, these are going to be found in your personal archive. Uh, they, uh, when you're going to look for these records, you're going to find them in personal collections, family collections, and those are going to be located in manuscript collections at a local or state archive. So look for them there. So what can report cards tell us about our family? Well, first, they're going to tell you what kind of subjects they were taught, which ones did they do well in, what did they not so well in. Um, and so I find it interesting to see what they were teaching back in the day as compared to what I was taught in school. So those are, that's interesting to know. Did your ancestor use what they learned in school during their lifetime? Uh, maybe you can see on the report cards that they did very well in certain subjects and then they went on to develop a profession in like chemistry or biology or maybe uh, they became a writer. And so they were very good at their English or their uh, writing skills and spelling. So maybe you can correlate those two with their um, report cards. Did their parents sign the report card? I don't know about you, but I'm constantly looking for original handwriting of my ancestors and especially their signature. So I don't know about you, Claire. I can remember running home from school. Uh, as I got older, I wasn't such in a hurry, <laughs> but I would take my report card home because my parent had to sign it. Well, if you find those old report cards, you may find your ancestor's parent sign the report card as well. And so that could be a true treasure for you. Maybe it's something you've been looking for, uh, the signature. So if you find these in an archive, you may be able to grasp that signature off that report card. Here is an example of a report card. This is for Katie uh, Retke, report card from 1900. Uh, we do not know what school that this is from because it is not listed on the report card. But as you can see, it gives her name, it gives the date of the term, um, and it gives the um, her grades, which she's done very well, did very well. Gives her times that she was tardy, which is none, she's very good, and how many days she was absent and her deportment and then the signature of her guardian. Uh, and so what a fantastic document to get all of this information from. Here is another report card, maybe one that looks more um, uh, like the ones you may have in your collection. This one is from Mary Elizabeth Shackelford. She was in the ninth grade and uh, her report card there on the back is where her mother signed it each and every month. Uh, and so if this is your ancestor and you're looking for a signature, this is a great way to find it.
Here's the inside of that report card. It gives her grades, gives her days present, days absent, days tardy. Um, and then at the bottom, I thought I found pretty interesting is that it tells you, they actually hand wrote it in there, what the grading scale was. Um, the grading scale is not that today. Uh, and so they give you the grading scale, which I thought was pretty interesting. So let's move on to yearbooks. Uh, this is probably something that you all have actually looked for, our yearbooks. Um, I have all of my yearbooks from when I was in school, and we collect yearbooks at the archives for the local schools in our area. These are probably one of the most well-known school records that genealogists look for, um, mainly because a lot of our online databases have added them to their databases, and so they are more prevalent and actually more available. So what can be found in yearbooks? Uh, here is actually a photograph of some of the yearbooks that we have in our archives. Where I live in Houston County, Tennessee, our capital city is Erin, Tennessee, and we have the Shamrock as our yearbook uh, because we had Irish railroad workers that came through here, built the railroad. Uh, they saw the terrain here, and it's they, the family lore is, is that they thought that it looked like Ireland here, so they named the city Erin. And so we have continued with the Irish theme in our community. So in your books, you can maybe find a photograph of your ancestors or family members. Um, I actually have a yearbook for my grandmother from her senior year in 1940 uh, out of Ohio. And it's an odd yearbook. It's not one that you would see that was actually published. It's actually looked like it was put together by hand because all of the photographs are snapshot photographs that they just pasted into the book. Uh, and so I don't know how many of those that they made, but she kept hers. And so that is a fantastic treasure for me. Maybe they're gonna put biographies of the students. I don't know if when you were a senior in high school, but I can remember that they added a little more about the seniors, especially because they were going to be going off and doing bigger and better things. So they would add a little bit of information about each senior. And maybe they did that in your ancestors uh, yearbook. And you may be surprised what you read about your parents, your grandparents and your ancestors. Um, because one thing that I've realized about researching in school records, my ancestors, and especially those family members that I knew, uh, before they became my parent or my grandparent, uh, they had a whole new life as children, young teenagers. And so you may learn of some things that you never knew about them. Were they involved in sports, academic, or social groups? Maybe there's photographs of them doing that, or maybe they're listed as part of a particular group or in sports. Uh, so that's something to look for. Your books are chock full of all kinds of great information. And what do we do with this information? We can take this information and add it to our family member or our ancestor's story. Uh, I don't know about you, but I love to put so much information with our ancestor that it actually tells a story. It makes my ancestors come alive to me, makes me to want to know them even more. And so a lot of this information can do that. One thing that people don't realize that your books have or they don't think about it is that they have business ads in them. You'll have to remember that many times when it comes to yearbooks, the uh, yearbook staff actually had to go out and get businesses to give them money in exchange for ads to help get the yearbooks published. And so you're going to find business ads in yearbooks. Well, if your ancestor owned a business and you are looking for any information about that business, look at the local school yearbooks. Here is an example of that. This is from a yearbook, the Erin High School yearbook from 1949. As you can see, these are all hand-drawn and handmade. They are advertising the local businesses in our area that actually paid to advertise in the yearbook. Uh, I have a couple of my ancestors that own businesses. I'm continually looking for a photo of their business or an advertisement for their business, something that I can put with their genealogy. So if you have ancestors that have businesses, don't forget to look in the local school yearbook to see if they advertised. Also, my heritage, ancestry, a lot of these major uh, databases, they have yearbooks in their databases. And so go and look at them. They may, uh, you may find yourself actually in those yearbooks. Uh, this is the um, Elysian yearbook advertisement from 1956. Uh, as you can see, it's advertising um, a gas station and a jewelry store. So the reason I'm showing you this is because this is my father's 
yearbook. And and he, I'm sorry, he, uh, I got to be able to find his photograph, a little bit about him, but I also got to look at these wonderful advertisements. Uh, to me, they're interesting, especially when you go back this far. So great place to find those. Another great place to find school records are actually in school newspapers. Uh, many schools have their own newspaper. Uh, a lot of times they did this as part of their curriculum. Uh, and so, but if you can find these school newspapers in archives, you may find some great tidbits about your own ancestor. Uh, these are these uh, articles and the things that are in the newspaper were usually written by and edited by the students as part of their grade usually. Uh, and so these newspapers will report on school news, student activities, um, sports, anything that was going on in the school. A lot of times it was reported in the school newspaper. So that's something that we should be looking for. Um, think about if your ancestor wrote for the school newspaper or maybe was the editor or maybe he was the photographer and took photos for the newspaper. Uh, you never know what you're going to find in those. Was your ancestor's photo in the newspaper? Uh, again, another great resource to find a photo of your ancestor um, and to see what they were up to while they were in school. And were they mentioned in an article? Was there something going on within the school that they felt very strongly about that maybe they were interviewed and maybe their comments are in an article? And so always read these newspapers. Uh, any newspaper that you're reading, whether it's a regular newspaper or a school newspaper, read it from the first page to the last page. Because I have found that even if you're using a search engine or if it's been indexed, I find that I can still find something that has not been found before. So always read the entire newspaper. Uh, again, this is from where I live. This is from 1999. This is the masthead for the Shamrock. That was the name of the newspaper here. They no longer do a school newspaper here, which I find is unfortunate, but they did do it back in the day. Local newspapers. Um, our local newspapers, and if you're a genealogist, I'm sure you're doing newspaper research all the time. But the local newspapers will pick up stories about the schools and publish it in the local newspaper. So they may publish events, happenings in the local schools. Um, unfortunately, many of these newspapers are not indexed. You can use a search engine on the newspaper website. It's not foolproof. Uh, that's why I encourage you to read page by page to try to find what you're looking for. Many of these local newspapers will actually print honor rolls or class lists, uh, especially from a long time ago. I know that today our my local newspaper will actually, especially at graduation time, they will actually put in the newspaper a photograph of each graduating senior and a little blurb about each person. And so way back in the day, they would actually list honor rolls and class lists like that. Newspapers are notorious for reporting on sporting events such as basketball, football, um, golf, any kind of sport that maybe the school was doing, they would report it in the local newspaper. Many times the locals or the people that um, had um, uh, a child in that sport would turn in a story, turn in some photographs, and so this is a great way to find that kind of information. Um, here's an example of that. This is a newspaper clipping of the Erin Elementary School cheerleaders. And guess what? It lists their names at the bottom. Uh, this is from about the 1950s. And wouldn't it be great to find something like this with your ancestor pictured and named? Uh, and it could add to their story. You could, did you know? I didn't even know sometimes that my ancestors did what they did before they married. Uh, I found some few things about my own parents that I didn't know that they were involved what they were involved in. My husband's father, I found out that he was on the yearbook staff. I never knew he was on the yearbook staff. Uh, unfortunately, my father-in-law has dementia right now, and so I'm not able to talk to him about it. But I was able to find information in school records. How about social club? Many of our the students in schools were a part of social clubs or civic clubs, and they reported them in the local newspaper. I believe me, if you go to a local newspaper and you start reading, you're going to find a lot of the school information was reported in the local newspaper. Academic achievements, if there was an academic banquet or there was awards academically given, a lot of times the local newspaper reporter would attend those, take photographs maybe, or just report on what happened. Even in some of the older newspapers, they would report on this kind of thing. 
And again, I've already mentioned senior and graduation photos. So how do I find this in the newspaper? Well, for the most part, graduation happens in May or June. Uh, and so you can narrow your search down in the newspapers to those two months when you're looking for graduation information. Uh, and so you can find lists or announcements about the graduation and maybe even photographs. Um, this is an example, actually kind of an odd example. This is actually a newspaper that was printed in the uh, early 1990s. But it is showing you a high, Aaron High School graduation class of 1943. Uh, many of you probably have seen this in your own local newspaper where they will publish something old, especially if it's their you know, 25th reunion or their 50th reunion. If you're trying to find when your ancestor went to school or graduated high school, check the newspapers when it's 25 years later, 50 years later, because they may print something about a reunion. And so this is, that's what this is in 1943 that uh, the members and they list the names. So evidently someone and the names are on this particular, this is actually a photograph. I have this photograph in my archives and the names are on each picture, but it was printed much, much later as part of a reunion uh, announcement in the paper. I love this one. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this was uh, printed in the 1950s in the newspaper and it's where the elementary school went to the circus. And you can see the teachers and the students, and you can see that giant elephant in the room that's behind there. So they did go to the circus. Uh, what's interesting about this, this is a newspaper clipping that was donated to the archives. And some, somebody went on there and wrote the names of the students, which is great because the newspaper clipping did not name anybody in the, the photograph. So we were able to get that information. Speaking of photographs, how about school photographs? Um, I know I have some school, school photographs that I don't want anybody to see, but they may also be some school photographs in an archive where you can find them for your parents, your grandparents, or your great-grandparents. Uh, you need to think about when photographs came into uh, being. Uh, they haven't, we haven't always had photographs, and so you're only going to be able to go back so far to find photographs. But as genealogists, aren't we always looking for photographs? I've got ancestors that I don't have photographs for that I'm continually trying to find a photograph for them. School photographs may help you in that area. Maybe you'll find a photograph of a group, uh, a class photo. Uh, hopefully they'll be identified. Uh, that's one thing I tell genealogists, if you've got a lot of photographs, please try to get them identified, especially if you have older members of your family still living, they can tell you who people are because once they're gone and you've got those photographs and you don't know who they are, they almost will never get identified. Here's a great uh, one of those class photos from 1961. I've always wondered how they took these kinds of photographs. Uh, it looks like they, they stood on a ladder or something. But this is a fantastic photograph of a classroom. And it's actually from the Erin Elementary School. And this is Mrs. Eva McKinnon, who was the teacher. She's standing there. And these are all the wonderful students. Wouldn't it be great to find a photograph like this in an archive and be able to identify somebody that was in your family? Again, this is one of those newspaper clippings where they published it much, many years later. This photo is actually from 1935, and it was published in the 1983 newspaper. But again, it is a great photo, and it lists all of the names of the people in the photo. So that's why newspaper research is actually very important for school records. Yearbooks, of course, we just talked about yearbooks. You can find photographs in yearbooks. We know that, so use that resource newspapers. We just talked about newspapers. That's a great place to find photographs uh, if they've been published. And school photos. Many times, and not in every school, uh, there was a photographer every single year. I remember it. I'm sure you remember it. And it was school class photo day. Uh, if you didn't come prepared for that, you will regret it many years later when you still have those photographs. But maybe you have a class photograph. This is a group class photograph. This one is actually from the early 1900s. Uh, unfortunately, there's only one person identified in this photograph, and it's the, the Ernest French there at the top left. He's in the very back row, far left. Um, nobody else in this photograph has been identified, which is absolutely sad. But this is a fantastic photograph. 
Uh, here's that picture from that Elysian yearbook from my father from 1956. Uh, I'm pointing to him with that red arrow. His name is Robert Lee Master. Sadly, he passed away in 2019. Uh, but he is in this yearbook. If I didn't have a photograph of my father, which I have many photographs of my father, uh, I have one of him as a young person. I will also tell you that if you are a person like me, that I do timelines for my ancestors. And I like to be able to fill in every single year of my ancestors' life in my timeline. And so I could fill in 1956 with this yearbook information. And so this is great information. We're going to move on now and talk about universities, colleges, military schools, and private schools. These should not be forgotten, especially if you know your ancestors went to school at one of these schools. So the local public schools are not the only resource for records. Uh, don't stop there. Uh, maybe your ancestors went on to a college, university, a military school, or a private school. Uh, so don't forget these types of schools as well, because there are records. Maybe you can find your ancestors' college transcript. Uh, these do exist. They will be located at the college or university. I'm asked all the time, well, what if the college or university doesn't exist anymore? Well, maybe their records were transferred to a neighboring college or university, or maybe they were given to the state archives or a local uh, historical society, genealogical society, you need to be looking at every archive uh, repository anywhere where there's records in the place where you're researching. Maybe you can find your ancestor's thesis or dissertation. Uh, these were also saved. Uh, many times they were published. Uh, I've actually found a couple of them on Google Books because they were printed in a book. Um, and so you might be able to find a thesis or dissertation for your ancestor. And I think that would be something fantastic to be able to add to your genealogy. School newspapers. You know, we talked about school newspapers in what I would call, you know, the elementary schools, secondary schools, the local public schools. But our colleges and universities, military schools, and private schools had school newspapers too. So look for those when you're talking to and you're researching at these schools. Uh, ask them if they have any old school newspapers. Again, these particular schools also had sports. They had clubs. They had fraternities. So you may be able to find some publications, some records about your ancestors' time in sports. Or maybe they were in a fraternity or a sorority and a particular social club or civic club that was at one of these schools. Um, here is an example. This is actually a student report from 1925. This is from the uh, Middleton State Teachers College. Uh, and this is for Miss Gertha Brooks. We actually got a collection of Miss Gertha Brooks records donated to our archive. She was a teacher uh, in our community for decades. And so we are very grateful to have gotten these records. These are her actual school records from a college. Uh, this Middle Tennessee uh, Teachers College was actually turned into Middle Tennessee State University, MTSU here in Tennessee. Here's another one of her. Uh, this is a college state of standing from 1930. And it tells you what subjects that she took and her grade and, things, and the credits that she received. So fantastic records if you can find them. So what if your ancestor was a teacher? Um, I have a couple of teachers in my ancestry, and so if you, your uh, ancestry was a teacher, there could be records available of their teaching career, like I just showed you. So you need to be looking for those. And here's Miss Gertha Brooks again. This is her teacher's license, her elementary license from 1919. Um, what I love about this, and I don't know that you could read it, so I pointed it out, and I'll read it for you. It says, this certifies that Gertha Brooks is a person of good moral character who does not, who does not use intoxicants, <laughs> opiates, or cigarettes, and having passed the examination required by laws uh, to teach in the elementary schools. And so this is a fantastic record. And on the back of that record are actually her subjects and her grades in those subjects. So um, great document to have. If Gertha Brooks was your ancestor, if it was my ancestor, I would love to have found this in an archive. Uh, this is her contract to teach from 1919 when she was hired to teach at the Pollard School in Houston County, Tennessee. This is her contract that she received to be able to teach at the Pollard School. Uh, so all of these records I'm showing you, they do exist. Now, do they exist everywhere? No, they don't. You are going to have to check and you're going to have to dig and talk to 
many of the archives, the local archives, may even still talk to the school board. A lot of these records are still sitting in rooms at a school board. So you're going to have to do your homework to find out where these records are located. And still, some of these records have been destroyed. Um, they've just been thrown away. And so don't be surprised if you can't find them, but we should still be looking for them. So my ancestor didn't go to school. Um, one of the things that I found that there are actually ancestors that are in school records that didn't go to school. And so I'm going to tell you about that. You're probably thinking to yourself, but my ancestor didn't go to school. Many of have, us have ancestors that didn't go to school. Uh, in fact, they either didn't read or write. Maybe they uh, only wrote a little bit. Maybe could only read a little bit. Maybe you have the story like some of my ancestors. They only went to school up to the sixth grade. Uh, well, you still need to look in those school records. And I'm going to show you why. Maybe they worked for the school. Did you think about that? Maybe your ancestor worked for the school. That means they could be in those school records, not as a teacher, but in some other capacity. There may be records available. Um, maybe they are records where it talks about them delivering coal or wood to the one-room schoolhouse. We have school board minute books where it talks about local residents who were hired to deliver coal and wood to the local schools. Uh, these people may or may not have gone to school, but if your ancestor did that for a local school, they may be listed in the school records. Maybe they drove a school bus, and so there'll be school bus contracts, or there'll be information in the school board minutes uh, where they were hired, and so look in those records for your unschooled ancestors. Maybe they provided handyman work at the school or did whatever type of task at that school. Many times when um, someone is going to get paid for doing a job, they have to be approved by the school board, which means they'll maybe mention in the school board meeting minutes. Uh, if you can get your hands on school board meeting minutes, they are a treasure trove of information. And maybe they served on the school board. They did not have to go to school to be able to school, serve on the school board. Many times these are elected positions. Uh, all they had to do was run and they could get elected to be on the school board. Uh, this is an example of some. This is actually my husband's great uncle, Luther Stringfield. Uh, I found this receipt actually, and believe me, back in the day, they would write on anything. But this is actually a receipt where he provided three tons of coal to the local schoolhouse and he got paid for that. Uh, Mr. Luther Stringfield did not go to school. Uh, he actually did work for the schools, but he did not attend school as a child. So this is an example of a document in the school records for someone who did not go to school. Um, here's another example. This is actually a school warrant. Uh, warrant is another uh, word for a check. Uh, he got paid in 1953. This is his voucher for, um, for used books. Back in the day, before the free book came into, free books for schools came into play, you had to purchase your books, and then you could turn them back in and you could get some of your money back. And so that's what this is. This is a check to Mr. Wade Stringfield, another great uncle of my husband's who did not go to school, and he's receiving this check. What's wonderful is that he endorsed the back of it. So I show you there where he endorsed it. So I have his signature now. School board minutes. I cannot emphasize enough how important school board minute books are. And many times these survive because a lot of our school boards have to go back and look when something was done uh, officially. So look for school board minutes. You may have to talk to the school board, look at the historical societies, genealogical societies, any kind of archive that's in the local area to see who has the school board minutes. They can be a gold mine for genealogists. Your ancestors, either schooled or unschooled, could be listed in them. Uh, and so look for those. They could have information about hiring and firing of employees. So if your ancestor was a teacher or drove a school bus, they may be listed as being hired uh, and they may have gotten in trouble or something and they maybe they got fired. All of this information will be in the school board minutes. Uh, purchasing and selling of school property. If your ancestor actually put, gave property for a particular one-room school has to be built on. Uh, maybe the school uh, board actually purchased the property from your ancestor. That's another reason why your unschooled ancestor could be in school records. And then the general operations of each individual school. Um, if you're like me, like I said, I researched all the schools that my ancestors went to that I can find out that uh, the names of the school. I can read these minutes and I can read about what happened at the school um, 
pretty much on a month to month basis uh, while my ancestor went to school there. And so great place to find that kind of information. Here's some examples of some school board meeting minutes. Now I use the transcribed ones because I wanted you to be able to read it. This is from January the 11th, 1908. Uh, see, these minutes go back pretty far. A petition of 29 families representing 50 pupils came before the board asking said board to establish a school at the Welker Place. Um, if you're looking for the school in the Welker Place, look here. In the school board minutes, they talk about it. It's on Leatherwood Creek, Creek near J.W. Welker's. After due consideration, the matter was deferred to the April meeting and a committee of three was appointed. So then you have to go to the April meeting to see maybe what happened. Uh, here's another example. This one's from 1912. W.A. O'Gwen is allowed an amount sufficient for hauling wood to schools to cover the amount of board timber he received left over from the Long Branch School. Uh, and so, and then it goes on to say that each commissioner, which is the school board commissioner, is allowed to open the schools as such time as may appear to him best for his people. Uh, and so fantastic information in the school board minutes. One more. In 1924, purpose is to address the question of transportation to the Yellow Creek School. Motion was made by Mr. Weaver. We, your committee, appointed to arrange for transportation of school children to the Yellow Creek uh, Consolidated School, beg leave to submit the following report. And they give the report. And it talks about the driver of the school truck, Mr. A.B. Skelton. Uh, it says that he would not continue to drive the said truck, therefore we found it necessary to employ another driver. So I don't know if Mr. A.B. Skelton went to school or not, but if he didn't, he's listed in school records. This is why school records are very important to our genealogy research. Sunday school records. Remember me telling you I was going to talk about Sunday school records. Uh, these are also a type of school record. Um, I actually had some that were donated to the archives, and that's why they came to me and to my attention, actually. Uh, maybe your ancestors attended a local church, and they had Sunday school. Well, many of these Sunday schools actually kept records, and maybe they're still located at the church. But maybe they went home with the Sunday school teacher. That's how I ended up with them in our archive. Uh, the local Sunday school teacher actually took some of these records home, got into her own records, and they were donated by her family. They will list teachers' names in those records, class attendance. They actually kept attendance. Uh, membership list, just like church membership, they would have membership for Sunday school class. And dates and places. We're always looking for dates and places. Um, maybe it will tell you when your ancestors moved into an area because they started going to church there, they started attending Sunday school, and they're listed in these records. Uh, this is that Sunday school book that I got. I got two of them. This is from the Wells Creek Sunday School from 1932. And here is a list of the people that were in that Sunday school class. It gives their names, it gives their address, it gives their date that they enrolled which is pretty interesting. And then it gives the date that they withdrew, meaning they were either promoted to a new Sunday school class or maybe they moved. Uh, and so they moved their membership to a different church. So great information in Sunday school classes. I know that I'm always doing research in church records. And so now I know to ask about Sunday school records. So it's something to look for. So how do we find these records? So now hopefully you are excited about looking for school records. So how do we find these records? So here are some tips on how you might find those records. First and foremost, a lot of these records are still going to be located at the local school district or the local school board. Now I want you to keep in mind something. When you're talking to these local school boards, they are doing the business of today. And so when you contact them, they're not going to be maybe as eager to help you because they're trying to do the business of today's schools. Uh, and so try to be patient with them. Ask them if you can come and look at the records. Uh, you can talk to them, I would say, by phone or email. Ask them if there's someone local that can look at the records for you if you don't live in the area. But be patient with them because, like I said, they're not normally working in the old records. Uh, they're usually doing the business of today. A lot of these records may be found at the local library. Uh, yearbooks are going to be found at the local library. All the newspapers I talked about could be on microfilm at the local library. Uh, and so work with local libraries. Again, um, many people are not able to travel. 
I'm not able to travel because I work full time as an archivist. And so the last 32 years, I have been doing my research for my family who are in West Virginia, they're in Ohio, Maryland, Pennsylvania. I do all of it from right here in Tennessee. Now there are going to be some records I'm going to have to go see, but for the most part, I've been patiently and diligently working with archives, libraries, historical societies, genealogical societies, museums, uh, by email, by phone, and by actually writing letters. And I've been doing pretty good with my ancestors, with my genealogy. So archives. There are all kinds of archives. Uh, there doesn't need to have the word archive on the building or in their name. If they have records that they're preserving, they are an archive. So you need to look at the local level, look and see what kind of archives are there. Maybe it's a historical society that has a building that has records in it. Maybe it's a library. They have a special genealogy room or genealogy collection. Look at those. And so just trying to find those records. Uh, historical and genealogical societies, not only do they have the records, uh, but they also have very, very informed, uh, intelligent members who are, are usually from the area that you may even connect with the cousin. And so talk to the membership and talk to them about the records that they have. And they reach out to those colleges, universities, military academies, and private schools if they still exist. If not, maybe find out where their records went to and try to do the research that way. So thank you very much for attending this presentation. I sure hope that it got you excited about doing research and school records. Um, uh, you can follow me on my blog, A Genealogist in the Archives, and you can also email me after this presentation if you have questions that we don't get to. Uh, there's my email address. It's also on the handout. Uh, email me with any of your archives questions. But get out there and do some research in those school records. I think you'll be surprised by what you'll be able to find. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over so any questions that we may have. Wow, thank you so much, Melissa. I know I learned a ton, and now I have so many things that I want to look at. <laughs> <laughs> Your to-do list just got really long, didn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we did have a couple questions. Um, so one question was, if you don't know what school your ancestor taught at or attended, how do you find what schools are in the area? That's another thing to use your school board minute books, because uh, many times they will list in there, especially back before consolidating schools, which is in the 1960s, um, they would list in there the different schools and each year which teachers were hired for what school. So if you at least know the county that your ancestor was uh, living in or the schools that you're looking for, you can look at those county school board minute books and hopefully find that information. I'm also thinking like city directories, um, sure. county yes. histories too, would talk about the different schools in the area. Um, yes. Or of course, reach out to your local library. They will connect you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the local library is a great place to find that kind of information. Someone's wondering, um, what are the earliest in time that school records are available? Like, are they, are, are they available for the 19th century? They are. Um, I have records dating back to the 1800s, and I live in a very rural uh, county in Tennessee that was only established in 1871, and we have records that date back to the 1880s. Uh, and so, but again, I caution you because not all of these records survived. Uh, up north, I know because I do a lot of my research for my own families up north, they have records that go, date back even further because they were there, you know, uh, a lot longer. But um, don't be hesitant to try to find these records. Yeah, and this person who asked about that said they were researching in Sauk in Iowa counties, which is in Wisconsin, and I, while we were talking, um, searched through the Wisconsin Historical Society and found that they have, like, an example that I found was school records from 1849 to 1916 for See? school district number four in Sauk County, so they Fantastic. are out there. <laughs> they are out there. You know, most of the, the struggle that we have as genealogists is finding where the records are, and so um, we just don't, don't need to give up. We need to keep looking. Yes, absolutely. Um, someone says that they've been searching for her dad's school records um, to mostly see where and who he lived with, but they were told that there's a law called FERPA, which is similar to HIPAA, so they weren't able to get his records. Do you know anything about that? 
if it's, if it's more recent and I say recent, I mean within the last 50 years or so, there are some areas that have some laws in place. Um, I know that in the state of Tennessee, other than personal information for school records within the last decade or two or three, um, you know, we're a sunshine state, which means all of our records are usually open to the public. Uh, and so, yeah, you may run into, depending on the time frame of when you're looking for records, uh, usually the 1800s up till, you know, mid 1900s, you shouldn't have a problem. Uh, after that, there are some areas that have some uh, restrictions. And then someone um, asked, they were trying to track down their ancestor who was a teacher. Um, so they're wondering how to specifically find what school um, in the 1890s and 1900s in Wisconsin. So again, like we talked about, you know, narrow it down to the county, um, look at those county histories or those city or county directories. And um, you can um, probably find your, your teacher ancestor in, in one of those directories. Absolutely. And then, you know, then look at the history of that area and see what colleges maybe weren't in that particular city or that particular county, but that were close. Uh, many of our ancestors did not travel that far to attend college at that time. Uh, today, you know, many of our, our kids will travel across the state, across the country to go to college. But back then, they tried to stay local. Um, someone said they've had zero luck finding an ancestor on newspapers.com, um, and they're wondering where they can search for school records in o Ohio, New York, and Pennsylvania. <laughs> well, just like we talked about, you need to start local. Talk to the local historical society. If you're looking for newspapers, um, I would talk to them, ask them where are the newspapers located? Um, are they located online somewhere? A lot of times those historical society members will know the answer to that question. Uh, or maybe they're on microfilm at a library. And so just have to ask who, um, who actually lives in the area and who does research in those uh, kinds of records and that could be able to tell you where they're at. Um, there's another question about privacy laws. Um, mm -hmm. Someone said, uh, my father's college refused to give me his transcript and said he had to be dead for 75 years. So what could anyone do with class lists and grades from the 1930s and 1940s? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are some of those rules and laws that are in place. Um, you know, if you if it's something that you really, really want, you could actually petition through the courts to get that. It's kind of like adoption records. You can petition, have them opened and given to you. Uh, other than that, um, you know, we're just kind of at the mercy of those laws. Um, someone said, my paternal ancestors were in Wilson County, Tennessee, not too far from Houston County, from about 1811 to 1861. Would there be any school record from that time period? And if so, where would I find such records? And they said that they don't live in, live in Tennessee. Yeah, um, actually, my husband's Barker ancestor, uh, his third great grandfather, Andrew Jackson Barker, was in Wilson County, Tennessee, uh, in a little place called Gladeville. Uh, but um, for that time frame, I uh, do not know if there are school records that are available, but I can tell you that they have a fantastic Wilson County archive. I would encourage you to contact them. Uh, if there are school records available in that county, they will be able to tell you. Um, someone's wondering, would a facial recognition software be able to match an old school photo with a photo of the ancestor as an adult? I don't know. I've not done, I've not dabbled much in facial recognition. Uh, that would be something that would be kind of neat to try. Uh, I would try it, but I honestly don't know if uh, that would be successful. Yeah, I'm not sure how accurate that is either, but <laughs> hey, it's worth a shot, right? It is, it is, yeah. <laughs> Someone said, what about country schools? I'm not sure what they mean, but probably trying to find records for yeah. country schools. I'm sure just like the other types of records, those would be available in some of the resources we talked about. Yeah, and I'm thinking, what, and, and when you talk about country schools, uh, if you do a history of our schools in the United States, up until about the 1960s, we would have what are called country schools or one-room school houses. And like in my area, we had several little communities and they all had names and usually the schools were named for that community. And so in our little bitty county where we now have only four schools, we have two elementaries, we have a middle school and a high school in our county. But back in the day, and not all at one time, but in the 19 teens and the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, we had literally 60 schools in our county because there was one in each little community in the one little country uh, school. The reason being is because there were usually was not much in the way of transportation. And so they had all these different schools so the children could go to walk and, you know, to school. So yeah, that's, that's probably what they mean by a country school. 
Our next one, um, they said, since you mentioned the trains in Houston County, when did they first um, come through that area? The trains were built through here was the uh, L&N Railroad, the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. It came through here in the 1850s. Uh, they were built through here in the 1850s. Um, our county was not established as a county until 1871, uh, but uh, those Irish railroad workers came through here at, in the 1850s building the railroad. Cool. Um, someone asked in the chat if we'll be sharing the presentation. We, we are recording and I will have it up on YouTube probably tomorrow or Saturday at the latest and I'll send an email to everybody who registered with that link to the recording. So yes, you can watch it again and um, get more tips if you missed them. Yeah, I don't see any other questions if unless anybody has any couple last minute ones, but thank you again, Melissa, so much. I really appreciate all your knowledge. Like I said before, you know, this isn't a subject that I was really familiar with or have researched myself. So um, this was really cool to learn more about and discover that, yes, they still exist even from, you know, the 19th century, possibly. You might find some cool school records on your ancestors. So well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, like I said, just go out there and look for those school records. All right, we did have a couple questions now. Someone's wondering, okay. where was the Shamrock paper published? It was published in Erin, Tennessee. It was actually published here. Uh, usually those, lo those school newspapers will be published at the local newspaper, meaning if you had a local newspaper, a lot of times they would publish those newspapers for the schools. Um, someone also said that their mom grew up in an orphanage in Danville, Virginia, um, which is in Pittsylvania County. Where should I look for records? Uh, again, get go local, look and see if there's a local historical society, genealogical society. A lot of times if you can pick the brains of these society members, they know where the records are located. Uh, and so reach out to them and tell them what you're looking for. Be concise, be as specific with what you're, you know, to tell them. And they should tell you what repositories are available and where those records might be located. And someone asked a clarifying question about the Shamrock paper. Was the name of the city Aaron? Yes. Okay. E R I N. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Someone said, great information. Thank you. There's lots of wonderful comments in the chat about how helpful everybody found it. And again, be sure to join us next month on August 18th at 6 p.m. We're going to be talking about Fold 3 and learning all we can about how to use Fold 3 Library Edition, which is one of our awesome genealogy databases that we have through the library. And I know lots of other local libraries have that as well. So hopefully you'll join us. Uh, the link to register for that is in the chat and as well as in the handout. And again, thank you so much, Melissa, for your time and knowledge. And we'll definitely host you again in the future. Well, thank you for having me. And I look forward to resetting again in the future. All right, everyone have a great night. Thanks again.